So, Barry, I'm looking. Yeah, there it is out in the distance. I can see him. It's lightning coming in. And look who's on board. It's the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. Ron, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're welcome, guys. My pleasure. Uh, I hope lightning's not all lathered up and uh, and stuff. No, no. He's just getting ready to run. I mean, <laughs> there you man, go. He's so, ready, okay. ready to go. So as we've been uh, talking before we started uh, with you, Ron, is we've been talking about uh, blood and matches. When is it too much? When is it, uh, you know, appropriate? And as a man that uh, ran his own promotion for so many years successfully, we wanted to get some of your feelings on this. So let's start at the very beginning. Of course, your father, the the legendary Buddy Fuller, had a series of matches with Mario Galento that were that were hard way. You know, that, that's a whole different uh, kettle of fish right there, Ron. So tell us about how those matches uh, affected your dad and, you know, the impact they had on the promotion and the territory your dad was working at the time. Well, you know, they actually did a lot of things uh, per, to prepare for that. They did two of these that I that I can remember. Both of those crowds, uh, one in Mobile, close to 40,000 people. The second in Atlanta and Ponce de Leon, somewhere in the 30,000s was estimated. I don't know what they, they actually came up with, a final figure or not on that. But uh, both of those crowds were monstrous. Uh, and they worked the angles prior to the Mobile show for about two months, basically, with between Dad and Galento, in which Dad had always been just a promoter there. He did not wrestle for the first two years that he started that promotion on the Gulf Coast in Mobile, Alabama. So uh, he was, Galento had a really good point uh, when he got after Dad about the fact that, uh, how come you don't have the guts to get in the ring uh, you're supposed to be a wrestler. We hear that you've wrestled everywhere else, but this is your territory and your company. And why is it that you don't have the guts to get in the ring to wrestle? Uh, so uh, they they played this back and forth for a few weeks, and then they actually got into a fight. They dead set it up to where they ran into each other in a restaurant in downtown Mobile and got into a fight in that restaurant. The fight started in a restaurant, went out into the street. The police came and the police recognized them. The police stood back. They didn't try to break it up. And dad was happy with that. He wanted it to kind of end that way. They actually busted each other a hard way in this fight in front of the restaurant. Uh, And Galento had parked his Cadillac. He had a Cadillac. He had parked his Cadillac out in front of the restaurant. And dad grabbed him by the back of the hair and he had that long black hair and he slammed his face into his 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 own Cadillac, into Galento's Cadillac, into the hood. And Dad said, "You know, they were they were shooting. They were they wanted it to be real. The cops believed it was real. They're standing there watching it." And he said, "When he slammed his face in the Cadillac, it actually dented the hood of the Cadillac. So <clears throat> it brushed his eye. That was one of the hard ways that happened during that fight." So anyway, they took that and they took them to jail, arrested them. Uh, They did the whole deal. They went through the court proceedings, went through the whole deal. And then they booked them in this big event in Ladd Stadium in Mobile, Alabama. This match, I think Dad told me later, years later, he didn't talk to me. I'm I'm at this time about, uh, I'm in the second grade, so I'm seven, seven, eight years old. And I, I didn't get to go to the match. It was so violent. I asked him years later, I said, how long did the match last? He said it was about seven minutes. And uh, I said, uh, what, how did you, how did y'all do that? You know, I mean, I don't know if y'all have ever seen the picture of Mario Galento after this match. Oh yeah. Um, with a swollen face. Absolutely. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, uh, 32 stitches in one eye, seven cuts in one eye, busted him seven times in one eye. Dad did. And, uh, he broke dad's nose in the, in the deal, hit him in the nose rather than the eye. And, uh, it, it was, it was a brutal, brutal event. Uh, it was long enough. It lasted seven minutes and they didn't have a finish. And I asked Dad. I said, "Well, what did you do? Was did you was every punch a hard way?" And he says, "No, it was one working punch and then a hard way punch." And uh, it just uh, so it was so brutal that the athletic commissioner came and threw the towel in and stopped the match. They would have probably gone longer. Uh, he said that they were going to go until they were unconscious. 
<laughs> and uh, I can believe that, knowing Dad. <clears throat> so that was kind of a, my first experience at seeing Hardway. And he had busted Dad's eye one place, but Dad busted him all over his forehead and, and both eyes. Uh, uh, both of them had black eyes. My father's eyes were so f- swollen that for two weeks he could not drive a car or he couldn't leave the house by himself. My mom would take him wherever he needed to go. Uh, his eyes were swollen shut. He couldn't hardly see. And I remember after about two weeks uh, looking at those eyes being black and full of blood, he went over to a mirror and he took his fingers and opened up the eyelids so he could s- see what it looked like inside, I assume. And blood shot out of his eye onto the mirror. Uh, they were, they were, it was brutal. It was brutal type of deal. And, uh, and that's what they did in order to get that huge house. And, uh, and then they did that match, the same match. That was in 1958, Mobile, Alabama. They did the same match in 1965 in Atlanta, Georgia. The only difference being in that match in Atlanta and Mobile, the referee was Joe Lewis. In the match in Atlanta, it was Rocky Marciano. So, uh, you know, they what he did is he drew in those boxing champions who were big at that time uh, to be able to to fill those big, huge stadiums, and uh, and they, and he did do it. So, that's basically kind of what happened in those two matches. Second match, uh, Dad was the only one. I think Mario was bleeding, as I remember. Now, I'm a lot older at that point. I'm actually watching that one from up top of the stadium. And uh, I I know that Mario was bleeding some, but Dad was bleeding very, very badly. Uh, Dad won the match. Uh, They have a picture. uh, I have a copy of it on my website in my gallery of of, uh, Paul Jones on one side of him and Rocky Marciano on the other. Dad has the championship belt in his hand, but you can see by the picture that he's, he's concussed. He, he has a concussion. He's, his eyes aren't looking, they're looking at the camera, but he's not there lights on, but he's not there. I mean, uh, they have just beat and battered and, uh, then half, half knocked their heads off. And, and, uh, that, comes back to haunt you someday. My dad died with Alzheimer's. Uh, my grandfather died with Alzheimer's. I have no idea how many hard ways Roy probably did, but uh, I know my dad did bunches of them. And he was, word was, from wrestlers that he hard weighed, he actually hit that he was the best in the world at it, that he could really bust somebody easily. And uh, I saw him do it many, many times. And he, he even wanted to show me once, and I said, no, I, you're not going to bust my <laughs> that's a, eye. That's I said, okay. <laughs> I said, you're, you're going a little far here, Dad. No, I don't think I need to have a busted eye to figure out how to do it. You know, I never busted anybody's eye, but uh, but that was the thing back in the 50s. Uh, and prior to the 50s, uh, there weren't many, wasn't much use of blades at that point. In fact, my dad ran the territory in Gulf Coast, and he actually told his wrestlers that he would pay them $25 for each hard way they did every week. And uh, I asked him, I said, well, how much money did you pay? And he said, well, you know, uh, and most guys would maybe do it once, and I would pay them $25. And, uh, and I was curious about Galento because he was such a far out there dude. I said, how about Galento? And he said, 150 usually a week. He would bust his eye six nights a week or his face six nights a week. Wow. He said it was just unbelievable what Glento was capable of doing. And then go in in some instances that I heard stories where guys went with him to get sewn up. And one guy, one doctor said, you know, uh, let me get the, 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 the anesthetic and uh, let me get the, uh, the stuff ready for you so that it won't hurt so much. And Glento said, oh, hell with that. Just sew it up. <laughs> didn't even he didn't care he didn't even he didn't even have to have the you know the the stuff so, that's going to so when ron i don't mean to interrupt i'm sorry when does that transition from hard way being what a promoter wanted to where you know whether it's uh in the northern part of the country or in the south where of course you you and your family were pro- uh, predominantly at when does that transition into people starting to use the blade 
I think Which, it probably starts somewhere in that time frame, in the late 50s, I, I really truly believe. And uh, <clears throat> Dad did it because his theory was that the hard way is not just the fact that you're going to bleed during the match, but it's what you look like the day or after the match and a week after the match. And in some cases, like in his, his and Galento's case, two or three weeks after the match. Yeah, and the people around town can see the results of there what happened. Yeah, you're, exactly. a walking, you're a walking billboard. That's basically yeah. what you are. You're a walking billboard. And everybody that sees you, they know who you are. And they go, wow, that was real. And it was real. So, you know, there's no denying it. So, uh, and I think guys started using the blade because it's easier. You, you know, uh, it's pretty difficult getting that that blow, for instance. You, you've got to get hit really hard to bust your eye. Uh, and, and it, uh, But if you know how to do it and Dad knew right where to hit, uh, it's really easy to do. But if a guy doesn't know where to hit you and he's trying to bust your eye, it can be extremely painful. I have had guys try to bust my eye. I wanted to do a hard way in Knoxville as late as 1975. Uh, uh, I wanted to have a hard way. I was going to the hospital. I already had a broken collarbone, and I was wrestling with a broken collarbone. I knew I needed to go to the hospital anyway, and I wanted to have a busted eye so that I could be sewn up at the same time. Uh, I was just trying to uh, to uh, really uh, influence the doctors as much as anybody else. I wanted them to see that, you know, wrestling was real. And uh, so, you know, it, that, I think that started to escape probably or somewhere or change somewhere around the 50s when the blade became a lot easier to do. And, uh, and it wasn't so called for to have hard ways anymore. Wow. So, Ron, I, I am a I'm a loyal listener of the Studcast, and I remember you vividly talking about uh, your cauliflower ear. Did you ever discuss on the Studcast your first time blading? No, I don't think. Well, I did maybe discuss it because my first, my second time, the first time I bladed, I did myself. The second time I bladed, uh, Ronnie Garvin cut me. And it was in Fort Myers, Florida. Uh, we were both wearing masks. We had worked a long six-month program, uh, Loser Leave Town. He came back as Mr. Uh, Fort Myers, and I came back as Mr. So-and-so, whatever. We had both lost matches. We had both come back and wearing matches, wearing masks. And uh, we were going to both go an hour that night and then blade each other. Uh, and uh, I, so I, I didn't, I'd never cut through a mask before. I had only cut myself once, period. So I told Ronnie, you do it. And Ronnie cut himself. And then my mask was thin. He had a real thick mask on and my mask was much thinner. When he cut me, he hit an artery and uh, it started, well, it bled, as you can imagine. I mean, it was, he, he did it. I lowered my face toward the mat and it just shot out of one side of one eye hole of that mask. Uh, it was probably a foot across instantly. And uh, it bled so bad that I couldn't see enough to finish the match with the mask on. I actually pulled my own mask off. And I was bleeding so bad that I fell down a couple, uh, and I would be facing the crowd. I would take these bumps and be holding the ropes on my knees or whatever. And I'm selling, obviously I'm bleeding like crazy. And, uh, I was shooting blood three rows back in ringside from the artery that was cutting my head. It looked like a sprinkler, <laughs> you know, like a, except it's red. And, uh, I remember, uh, about after three minutes or four minutes of that, Les Thatcher came from the dressing room. And he tried to stop the match. He pushed me into the corner and he pinned me in there. And I was bleeding all over him, too. And he said, hey, you, you're bleeding to death, you idiot. And I said, oh, I said, it's going great, Les. Well, we got him. Get out of the way. <laughs> you know, I was just so gung-ho. I wanted to just keep it going. And he was like, you got to get out of here. We got to get you to the hospital. And I remember looking at the, at, at the, at the ringsiders, and there was nobody in the first three rows of ringside except one guy and a girl that was with him. And I remember 
taking the bump intentionally, I said, man, I'm going to get them all. I'm going to run them all out of here. And when I took that bump up, I'm leaning over the ropes and that blood shooting straight out. And I just, uh, I just aimed at them. I just moved my head <laughs> enough and the blood went right across her white dress. She was wearing a white dress and it went blah, 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 just a glob of it, man. And I, Oh, here they got up and left. I was like, well, I'm going to go to the dressing room. I guess that's enough. <laughs> well, I, you know, I would say Ron, that if you, uh, had Ronnie Garvin do that, there certainly has to be a trust factor uh, where you're you're basically uh, giving giving him, you know, you, you talk about wrestling is, is giving your opponent your body. Well, in this case, you're giving him your head uh, and there's got to be a, a real trust. But you said that you had, uh, the first time you had done it yourself. So it was it your father that showed you the way to go on that or was it somebody else in the dressing room? Oh, somebody else. Now, my dad uh, would never show me how to blade. Uh, I mean, uh, he I don't know that my dad used blades. <laughs> you know, I, most of the time, I think he let people hard way him when he was going to get busted. And he didn't like the use of the blade because he was always afraid that people would see it. Uh, you know, with a hard way, they, they see it, but it's real, you know. Sure. So there's nothing there that, that isn't real. But uh, that blade is a little more difficult. So, yeah, I had other guys that showed me how to do it. Uh, I usually, after that experience with Ronnie, I started doing myself naturally. And I don't think, I, I used to let Don Carson, who was very good at it, do me uh, in Southeastern in Knoxville in the 75, 76 time frame. And he was so good at it, I'd just let him do it. But uh, other guys, no, I, I really didn't trust a, a lot of people to to use that blade on me. It, uh, so where, it, uh, where, if you don't mind me asking, you know, famously Ric Flair keeps them in his, uh, taped in his fingers. I've heard of other guys that kept them in their mouth. Where did you hide the gimmick? In my mouth. Oh, really? Okay. In my mouth. I would put it in the back of my jaw Uh and where your where your big teeth are back there, uh, between uh, the side of my gum and my cheek, and uh, I always felt uh, f fairly comfortable when I first tried it. I, I kept thinking, "Gosh, man, I hope I don't swallow this or you know something." But uh, but I, I never did have a problem with it. But yeah, and everybody had their own way of doing it. Uh, they had their own way of making their blade. Uh, they had their own way of taping it to their fingers or they, wherever they were going to use it. Uh, everybody had their own style of doing it. And uh, I, I never really felt comfortable with it. And I think a lot of that was because of my influence from my father, who, who, who just didn't like it, you know. And uh, But... Uh, Gosh, uh, I used a bunch of them, uh, obviously, and uh, my brother was excellent at it. My brother always got great blood, uh, and some guys, I had a harder time. I, I, I think I felt sorry for myself. I didn't really want to do it. Uh, you know, my brother, he, he, boy, he didn't care. Bang. It was, it was always there, and, uh, and some guys were better at it than others. And some guys were sure much better at hiding it than others. I have seen some guys that were just, oh, I wanted to go, oh, my God, that's horrible, you know. So that was the, that was the downfall. And the bad part about it is you, you work your ass off to get your wrestlers over and to get an angle working and, and everybody getting into it. And, boy, you didn't want to destroy it or destroy your business by somebody just doing something that's right in front of everybody's eyes. And and I have seen that happen. Wow. So you mentioned uh, we were talking about Mario Galento, and there was a match, I believe it was in 1969, and there was a hellacious feud. Mario Galento was actually the baby face. This happened in uh, in Florida, and he was wrestling against J.C. Dykes. And I believe it was a brass knuckles match. And J.C. Dykes, at the end of this match, it looks like somebody had just taken him and dipped him into a pool of blood. And I've got the photos. Unfortunately, they're black and white photos, so it's not going to have the same kind of impact. Uh, but you, you were in a territory in Knoxville with a guy who's considered probably – one of the great bladers of all time. And I don't know if blade's even the accurate term because Ron Wright had something that was called the <laughs> chisel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's not blading. <laughs> believe okay. me. So, uh, believe so what, me, when you see that tool, when you see that tool, it, 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 it's a whole new ball game. 
Uh, first time I ever met Ron Wright uh, was in Florida in 1971, and he came through and stayed two weeks, I think it was, and he brought his chisel. That's what he called it, was his chisel. He had that old way in the Tennessee accent, my chisel. I'm going to get me somebody down here in Florida with my chisel. And he sat in the dressing room, and he'd, it, it's a little piece of metal about uh, two inches wide and uh, all the way across the palm of the, uh, the back of your hand, and you just slide it on your hand. And uh, on top of that metal, he had a little triangular-shaped piece of metal that stuck up about at least a half an inch high. And it kind of uh, obviously, since it's triangular shaped, it's thicker at the bottom than it was at the top. And he would just basically hit you with that. And it would cut you. Oh, it cut you deep. And you would, oh, blood was just amazing from using, using the chisel. And, and uh, nobody had ever seen it in Florida. And he came in and he took it out and he started, he took his little, uh, he had a little file with it. And he started filing his chisel. And we all sat uh, looking at each other and like, what the hell is he doing? And I think somebody finally went over and said, what are you doing, man? And he goes, uh, that's my chisel. You know, he goes, well, what do you do with that? And he goes, I put it on my hand and that, I'm going to get some juice on somebody. I was like, God, well, we all were. We were all appalled. They're like, oh, my God, man, is he is he for real? And then he just, he said, uh, on his first night there, he says, I'm going to be here two weeks, and I guarantee you I'm going to hit somebody with my chisel before I go. And his last night there was a battle royal in Lakeland, Florida, and he got a guy named, uh, well, I can't remember, it was a young guy that had been Joe Flaherty. He had worked there for a while, a young guy. I don't think he ever became a star of any kind. But he tied Joe Flaherty in the ropes in the middle of a battle royal, and he pulled out his chisel and put it on. I, we all backed off. I mean, like the battle royal was over. I mean, we all just backed off like, oh, hell my gosh, what is this? And uh, old Flaherty's kicking and fighting because he sees him coming, and he's been watching that chisel get filed all week long like the rest of us. And he popped him, and man, I'm telling you, instantly he's, he's bloody all the way down to his waist. You can't see any skin but red, and... uh that was a that was a pretty horrifying tool that chisel. So, Ron, let me ask you. Let, let me have you uh, put your promoter's hat on now uh, for the next uh, couple of questions that I have for you. So, you know, the, there was an old adage that said, "Red makes green." So, you're the promoter in a territory. How is it you determine when to use blood and when not to? Uh, when is it too much? When is it like I don't know, not enough? Would do you prefer to use it in a match, in an angle? How, how are you as a promoter approaching the use of blood in your well, territory? You, you, you didn't want to do, you didn't want to have blood every night. I mean, if you do it every night, it, it means nothing. So, you know, you, you want to have it every once in a while. You, you don't want to have blood in two matches or three matches on the same card, uh, or even, uh, you know, more than say, uh, once a week, you know, uh, as an example. Uh, so you kind of pick the hottest angle. You you pick the, for where you want to go. I mean, uh, hey, these guys are really into it. It's going to make sense. Let's do it tonight. Uh, sometimes you do the double blood. I mean, uh, and that makes it even more effective. Uh, and then you, it it usually jumped your crowds. I mean, it it certainly uh, translated into dollars. That's for darn sure. Uh, and but that's but, when you use it on a, on a more limited basis. And as you said, not like, you know, because if you see it every single match or every single night, it l stops losing its meaning. Yeah. Yeah. It's meaningless. After a while, people go, well, hell, I, you know, I expect him to bleed. It means nothing at that point. Now, you don't want to do that. Uh, it's important because the sport is wrestling and you and you start out two guys it, the greatest program starts with two two wrestlers that just really basically wrestling and then they have a problem and then it escalates and it escalates and it it gets a little worse and every time they wrestle it's a little more violent and then finally there's a time for it it's time when it when it makes sense and that's when it draws money it's got to make sense you don't want to just do it if there's for no reason whatsoever uh, it's it's got to start with a with an angle that builds into a program and the program becomes so strong and the the this the the emphasis on these two wrestlers becomes so strong that it's time to to use the blood uh and uh yeah, I, I think there was a 
was a place for it. There definitely was a place for it. I think it helped to to put asses in the seats, uh, and it was it, it it was part of the business. You did not refuse. I don't ever remember anybody saying no. I, I won't do it. I'm sure there were guys that that refused to do it, but uh, I don't remember in the South or the play you know, Australia, Japan, uh, you know wherever. Uh, you know, where they said, no, I'm not going to do it. Uh, and hell, if you look at Japan as an example, you it, Brody and Hanson, <laughs> you know, take those guys. I mean, you know, you're going to get a lot of that there. You, They were doing quite a bit of that there. And, uh, you know, they I was there and I did it. They wanted it. I did it. I mean, it was it was part of the business to do it. Yeah, and it was interesting, too. I reached out to uh Masahori, who is uh, the Japanese super fan, and I, I asked him about the origins of blading in Japan, and he said it began in 1962 with uh, Ricky Dozan and, uh, and uh, geez, what was the other guy's name? But it was Ricky Dozan that essentially brought uh, blading over there, and there was a match. I believe Freddie Blassie was involved, and apparently six people that saw this match because of all of the blood and it was the first time they had ever seen blood in a wrestling match in Japan six people apparently died of heart attacks which I guess is what the legend is which is really interesting so Ron in all of your travels too and it was interesting because I just uh, posted a view a photo of you wrestling Abdullah the Butcher in West Palm Beach the other day who do you think used blood and when i say blood it can be the blade it can be the chisel it can be hard way but who used it most effectively because obviously guys like abdullah and the sheik and even dusty you know used it almost every match it, it was there was such a regularity to it that you know as i was telling jeff before we uh we started recording with you every wednesday night in the mid to late 70s, you knew Dusty was going to bleed. There was no surprise. But who was the most effective bleeder, in your opinion? You mean someone that did it more often or got the most blood? Just, I think somebody that got the most out of it. And when I say that, maybe the most crowd reaction. And I'll give you an example, too. Uh, and, and I can't say because I wasn't there, but I was at the uh, WFIA convention in 1978. Uh, and it was uh, it was a great you know it was a great experience and we we saw a Russian chain match between Ronnie Garvin and the Great Malenko and if you saw a gimmick match like that whether it's a Texas bull rope match or a steel cage match or a Russian chain match you do expect blood. That being said, Ronnie Garvin hit a gusher, and I mean he he was bleeding everywhere, and because I wasn't uh, familiar with your territory. You know, first time ever seeing it live, I walked away and I was just, hold, that was a holy shit moment. I mean, you know, Ronnie Garvin really left an impact. So who, in your opinion, uh, of everybody you worked with, and maybe there were guys that you didn't expect were going to be blading. You know, you mentioned uh, about people refusing to blade. And I think Jack Briscoe, I believe he bladed once or somebody bladed him. And then he said, never again. And I got to be honest, you know, I, I grew again, I grew up watching Jack Briscoe. I don't I can't remember Jack ever bleeding in a match. Yeah. So he may Jack, have refused. Jack like yeah, you're right about that. Jack didn't like it. Yeah. I remember my father one time when Jack was really hot, uh, wanted Jack the hard way a guy on television because uh, they had some kind of bounty deal going and they were sending in these bounty hunters after Jack. And Dad said, oh, "We want you to bla We want you to bust this guy hard way." And Jack says, "No, no, I don't. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it." Well, Eddie and Dad really harped on it. I was I was there in the dressing room and heard the conversation. And Jack kept saying, "No, no, I don't. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this." And they said, "Oh, you need it. We need it. We need to bust him a hard way. We want it to be real. We want to show him next week on TV." Uh, the whole deal. And uh, Jack tried to bust him. And I remember he couldn't bust him. Uh, oh, and that was, and I watched Jack. Uh, it was, it was really difficult because I, I really admired Jack. And I really, I really, Jack helped me a lot as a young guy is getting started. And uh, I felt sorry for Jack 
because you know he didn't want to do it to begin with, and then he couldn't do it. He, he just and he hit the guy. The guy really went for it. The guy just kept coming back. Again, it was a Mexican kid, and I don't remember his name, but boy, well, Jack just banged him, banged him, and me at least four or five times. Uh, this, this was in this was in Florida, right? This was in Florida. This was on TV. So, in fact, you know it was on TV match. That was, Where? if I'm correct, I think his name was Gil Rivera. There you go. Could have been. He was. Yeah, he was brought in as a, I believe it was a bounty hunter, and there, I have, Jeff, if you remind me too, I can get this up in our Facebook group, I have photos that made the front cover of the weekly wrestling program of this guy, and his face is all caved in, he's beat up, yeah. I never knew the backstory, there it is. There it is. I mean, he could not bust him because he did not hit him. It's all based upon that eye, just above your eye, that eyelid bone there is very sharp. If you run your fingers along the edge of it, you can feel that bone in there. It has a little bit of a, a triangular shape to it. And if you put that knuckle right on that spot right there, it's going to cut easily through that eyebrow that uh, above your eye. And uh, that's where they were trying to get Jack to hit him. And Jack couldn't hit him in the right place. And the guy had a lot of guts. He just, he didn't, he, I thought a lot, I felt sorry for the guy too. I thought he would get out of the ring and go to the dressing room, but he stayed there. And Jack probably hit him four or five times. I knew he was going to be really nasty looking, swell up and look brutally bad, but they wanted the blood too. They wanted that blood factor too. And uh, I think that uh, Eddie and Dad might have been a little disappointed with the outcome of that. I know Jack dis despised that match, and uh, and I'm, I'm sure the Mexican boy didn't care much for it either. Well, Ron, on behalf of all the listeners uh, here for Breaking k with Valdron and Barry and yourself, once again, Barry Rose coming in with a name out of the hat, Gil Rivera. <laughs> it's a long way to stump Barry on CWF trivia there, Ron. <laughs> yeah, that is. I mean, that's pretty amazing. And I believe he was a Mexican boy. I know it was he an was. act which he yeah. was coming in as a bounty guy. And uh, Dad and Eddie said, hey, Jack, uh, this is what we want to do on TV today. We want to stop the bounties. We want to, we want to make a point here. And uh, uh, it, was a, it was an experience for me as a young guy to hear that conversation, to go out there and watch what happened and, uh, and, and to feel sorry for practically everybody who was involved, to be honest with you. So let me ask you, Ron, getting back to your time as a promoter now, uh, one of the things on the Studcast that you've talked about uh, recently is your move to the new station and uh, all the great help you were getting uh, you know, production-wise from the people that worked at that station. But you were talking recently about when you ran your first angle on the, uh, the station and, and the impact it had. So let me ask you, when you're doing a hot angle that involves a lot of blood, how do the people at the TV station react? Are they objecting to that? Are they okay with it because they know maybe it's going to increase ratings? What was your experience along those lines? Well, you know, when you're dealing with television people, they're in the television business and they're not in the wrestling business. Uh, they don't like blood particularly. I found that they didn't like blood. Uh, I really never had very many people complain about it. When I had my last wrestling company, USA Wrestling, in 1988, back in Knoxville, Gordon Sully doing the program. We're doing it in a big studio. And uh, I had a young kid named Todd Morton get blood for for the stomper, Mongolian stomper. And it was one of those that he hit a, he hit an artery and it was, it was extreme blood, uh, really so extreme that they, the television station went back. And once he started bleeding, they put that little fuzzy looking face over his face. They didn't show the blood. And that was my first experience with being with a television station that did not want to, to, to carry that, you know, uh, and it was a lot of blood. It was extreme blood in that particular match. And then you and you can have that. But it's it's you know, the stations don't like it. I don't think they really liked it, but uh, they loved the numbers by golly, and that's what they had you on there for. You were producing them those big numbers, and they're selling those commercials for a lot of money. Yeah, it, I got I gotta tell you too, Ron, I, I absolutely love the stud cast. Uh, 
I listen every week, and I listened to this past week, and you were uh, it was great stories talking about Ricky Gibson and your cousin Jimmy Golden, and we saw them in Florida in 1975. They came in as a tag team, and uh, they were yeah they didn't get a huge push, but they were over with the fans, and they left an impression on me. So I've actually gone in and I've uh, I've cataloged and documented their ring record as a team in 1975. But the reason I bring that up, and I I encourage everybody to check out our Arcadian Vanguard brother, Ron Fuller in the stud cast every week. Uh, It's besides our podcast, Ron. It's my favorite podcast. Don't tell anybody. Wait a uh, minute. (laughs) Thank you very much. (laughs) I'm I'm breaking kayfabe on that. Absolutely. But so Ricky Gibson and the late Ricky Gibson was a hell of a worker, uh, but he was known for hitting the blade. And he was, if I'm correct, Jeff, wasn't he in the original Tupelo concession stand brawl? I think Ricky and Robert may have been in the, uh, as a tag team in the original Tupelo uh, concession brawl. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So Ricky was a, uh, a very, very good worker. But there are uh, a couple of matches that are out there. I know there's photos too. But he's a guy that apparently did like the blade as well because he is uh, just absolutely covered in blood, similar to what we saw from Tommy Rich. Uh, Tommy Rich in I guess it was the the 1990s. Uh, was working a lot of high schools in Georgia, and they released a, a video, and it was called The Bloodiest Battles of the South. And it was very odd because you'd have Tommy Rich wrestling these guys. He would just hit the blade really hard. He's covered in blood all the way down his legs from head to toe, and he's stumbling around high school gymnasiums in front of little kids. So it looks really odd. Uh, to see it. But uh, Ron, do you think that we'll ever see the blade come back in a, in a a major promotion? And when I say that, I I don't mean like a very small outlaw promotion uh, that relies on blood and gimmick matches and things like that, but where blood will be used to really make a point. And Jeff and I both agree with you. Jeff and I have discussed this Blood is to me. It's an exclamation point. It, it it needs to to have an impact on you, and doesn't need to be used in every match. And and you know it, it's used to the point of overkill. But it was recently used in AEW, which is the new promotion, and it was a match between the two sons of Dusty Rhodes, Cody and Dustin, and it was very impactful. As I watched it, you know, again, it was a holy shit moment for me. I sat there, and it was very impactful. Do you think that we'll ever see blood on a fairly regular basis in a mainstream promotion? And I guess mainstream being somebody that has a TV outlet. Uh, I, I, I don't think so. Uh, and I don't, and I don't think it's because of the promotions, uh, uh, feeling about it. I think it's more based upon these uh, major networks and these major, uh, uh, cable affiliates. Uh, you know, I just, uh, they don't see them letting you go there anymore. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's a very violent thing. And, uh, and as you said, it, it may, it's impactful. And, uh, as long as you don't see it too much and that that's probably one of the reasons that it is, is more impactful today because it has kind of stopped being done in, in, uh, in a lot of places and they just don't do it a lot anymore. And, uh, that's going to always lead to a, a greater impact, uh, I'll tell you real quickly here, guys, uh, Australia, 1973. I'm working there, and the Aussies are just doing jobs. It's been that way since Barnett started there. And uh, my dad's involved with him in 73. I'm in that crew. And I hear them talking to George Barnes, who is an Australian. And they tell him, George, we we want dad. Dad had an idea. He said, let's quit taking the Australians and just beating them to pieces. This is their country. Let's take an Aussie, pick one, and let's make a star out of him. And in order to do that, let's bust him a hard way on TV and let everybody see that blood and, uh, and let him do a good interview. And let's turn this thing around in Australia. Uh, and they did it with a guy named Greg Peterson, little small guy, used to be a great sure. worker back in the sixties. 
And uh, Greg Peterson is very good at busting guys hard way. And he hit George Barnes, busting him hard way on television in Australia. And I will never forget it. He beat Peterson in the middle of the ring. First time that an Aussie had ever probably won a match in the history of Australia. Uh, and it was a moment in that country and he went to that microphone and grabbed it and and then he that Aussie accent said my god you know they'll never beat an Aussie again they'll never stop me now you know and he did a phenomenal interview it like it lit up I got a feeling in watching that 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 country Every place that show went, those Aussies are going to stand up in their homes and go, yes, yes, you know, and it really, really had an impact. That blood and that hard way had a tremendous impact on wrestling in Australia. Okay, well, Ron, as we're uh, starting to wrap up here, and let me just tell you how much we appreciate you taking some time out of your uh, your day to do this. This is, this is really great stuff. So the obvious question uh, as we wrap up is, so tell me, not you yourself, but as a promoter, as a guy working on a card, what is the what's the bloodiest match you've ever seen or that you remember seeing? Oh, geez, I have seen some really, really bloody matches. Uh, you know, as you said, Tommy Rich was always great. Tommy always got a whole lot of blood. Uh, Ricky Gibson really got a lot of blood, too. Uh, uh, gosh, I can't come, you know, I have seen so many of them. I have seen guys bloody down to their shoes. Uh, and, uh, I was that way myself in Fort Myers, uh, with that cut that artery. And, uh, it's, it, there are guys that are just Abdullah, uh, Abby gets, got lots of juice in his lifetime. My gosh, almighty. And, and, and not just on him. He liked to do it with others. Uh, work with Sheik. Sheik was same thing. Uh, uh, some guys just built their careers around blood. Uh, and, uh, you know, those guys, obviously, uh, they probably didn't get as much as some of the guys that, that didn't get blood a lot. Uh, uh, I think uh, those that really bled down to their shoes went too far. And I think if you had a chance to talk to them afterwards, said, would you have gone that deep if you had known where it was going to go? Uh, they would have probably said, no, I, I wish I hadn't have, you know, but uh though that's a it was a strange it's a hard and difficult part of the business guys uh, uh getting blood uh and uh, i don't care who you were uh, some guys didn't mind it dusty got it every night like he said and he needed to he was in the middle of a tremendously hot angle that just roared it drove florida business through the roof and he had all those heels of Gary Hart's to contend with, and they needed it every night. And by golly, he never backed away from it. He gave it to everybody. In fact, he got to where he didn't just blade his head, he'd blade his arms and his shoulders, and you know, he would just bleed everywhere sometimes. Uh, and I had a lot of admiration for Dusty for being able to do that. Uh, uh, they, and, uh, so, you know, I don't have any one particular match that really I can uh, off the top of my head. I have seen my brother bleed to his shoes on many, many occasions, uh, a lot better job than I would ever done uh, in that circumstance and haven't been asked to. Uh, how, how did, uh, I was just thinking, how did Jimmy feel about it? Jimmy got it, too. Yeah. Jimmy was good at it, too. I mean, uh, it was a part of the business. Uh, those guys that really had their heart in the business, they they did their best, and some of them some of them went a little too far sometimes, I think. Uh, but uh, you know, you they were I, I I just admired guys that were willing to do it on a regular basis and do it right. Uh, it took a lot of heart, and uh, it was uh, it was part of the business, uh, and and I don't know that it'll ever be a part of the business anywhere near like it was 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Well, listen, once again, on behalf of Barry Ron, we really appreciate you taking time out of your day. Uh, we want to encourage all the, I can't imagine anyone that listens to this show, Barry, that uh, doesn't listen to the Studcast because that is that is the go-to place for wrestling history. Uh, I'm keeping up. I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by uh, the Knoxville stuff, Ron, and your switch to the new station that you've been talking about over the last, I don't know, three, maybe three four episodes and uh, the way it affected uh, the business there in Knoxville, just really, really stellar stuff. And we do appreciate your time tonight, Ron. Well, thank you very much, guys. Uh, I enjoyed being on and uh, anytime. Thank you so much. Thank you.